All right, we are live. Welcome, guys. Welcome to the journey within. It's a journey of deconstruction and reconstruction of a death and rebirth. And today, I've got a very special fellow hypnotist, the founder of Twin Ravens Hypnotherapy and Research, J. Robert Parker in the house. <laughs> Thanks for having me, man. <laughs> nice dude, thank here. you thank you dude i think this will be a fun conversation because i mean we absolutely we both study hypnosis and i'd be very interested to get your perspective you know and how you got into this so um yeah if you can share a little bit about who you are how did you even get into this strange <laughs> world of hypnosis uh that's an odd story um so i previously prior to the pandemic had been working as a chef uh that restaurant's actually where i met my partner we did the stereotypical line cook ends up with the waitress thing Interesting. and uh the the pandemic hit and i had kind of seen the writing on the wall long before it actually had an effect and long story short you know, say we both ended up out of a job and it fell to me to Kind of pull something out of my bag of tricks to make money i live in a very very small town and there's not a lot of ways to go about that <clears throat> so i ended up uh reading tarot cards professionally and i was making a pretty good living doing that and i noticed that i was less reading people's fortunes so to speak and more uh using the archetypes of the tarot cards uh, to reframe their problems to them and help change their perspective. And I got a lot of satisfaction out of that. And I started looking into what is a way that I can do only that. Uh, and of course, an abnormal way that I can do that because well, why not? And the Facebook algorithm uh, at one random point my in front of me and previous to that i hadn't really had any experience with hypnosis i wasn't even sure if it was real i was in that camp and i talked to someone from admissions and they intrigued me i figured why not give it a shot this seems very interesting and i think i was about two classes into 101 before i got my mind blown first time I saw the, the physiological responses of hypnosis, the, the things that can't be faked, that are just reactionary. Um, it just blew my mind. And then eventually I actually got to perform hypnosis. And then eventually I got to experience it. And that was a profound thing because uh, going to that school, taught me a lot about myself and one of the things I came to learn is uh, a lot of what I had considered to be unusual behavior in myself uh, wasn't and a lot of what I considered to be unusual behavior in others wasn't I was just very extreme on one end of the suggestibility scale and I remember in class when they were explaining the the traits of the intellectual suggestible i was just like oh cool that's me and uh -huh. i took the suggestibility test and i scored like 82 I... my first time i want to say jeez man that's such an interesting thing because you're i mean obviously you're so rare and for you to actually be in hypnosis and experience hypnosis uh yeah. i'm curious like who who hypnotized you and how do they do it right because you're um, like the hard type. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was actually in a practice and it was with somebody. Um, I mean, I guess I should mention this guy named Paul Villarreal. And he's since graduated, I believe. And uh, he, I, I told him what my suggestibility was. And he said, cool, can I try something? And he did what's called an auto dual induction. 
and that was the first time that it happened to me and that that got me it got me well enough that the next day i wrote my own custom version of that script uh based upon what worked for me and that was a very unusual thing because previous to that i i did most of my experience with trance was with self-hypnosis like i could kind of help people along whenever they were practicing on me because I was very aware of that state in myself and where I'd been there in the past and all that stuff. But in terms of outright just being hypnotized by somebody, uh, that was the first time. <laughs> and uh, that was profound. Uh, the things that I learned and saw in that first time still kind of uh, guide a lot of what I do for my clients. Because one of the things, I don't really remember too much of what was addressed, but one of the things that stands out to me was I was introduced to this future version of myself, like five years in the future or so. And that was really profound to me. And that, that person that I saw kind of sticks out in my head and I, every day. I think about what I can do to get to that point. And I have used that to very great therapeutic effect with certain clients. I, uh, I got the specialization in transgender hypnotherapy. And one of the things I found with my transgender clients is that because that class made me realize so much that it wasn't just a psychological thing, that it was a it was a physiological thing. And in that, that means that your brain is telling you that you look one way, and what you're seeing in the mirror is telling you something very different. So what if you were able to meet who you know you are? What if you were able to meet the person that looks how you know you're supposed to look? And I find that having that, giving that to that person is substantial to their, their sense of self and their sense of well-being. Interesting. Interesting. So that, that does sound intriguing for, so for someone who is, you know, they're looking to really meet their future, you know, five years from the future self, how, how can we do that? Um, do you do that through self-hypnosis? This is a visualization. Um, um, visualization. visualization. I tend to, I tend to use the use elevator. The elevator. Uh, the, uh, yeah. For anyone listening that doesn't know what that is, it's a type of hypnotic induction or deepener where you start at a certain floor on an elevator and go down. Elevator opens and you meet this, this person. And I make no attempt to describe this person. It is simply you in advance. And I, I tell you to notice how this person looks, how they hold themselves, how they smell, like how, how they feel. And it's, it, depending on your suggestibility is kind of how profound that experience is. I, um, I don't get hardly any visualization. Uh, I get weird flashes. Uh, I can't smell anything. I don't really get anything auditory, but I get very heavy kinesthetic response. Uh, Interesting. Feel things. Yeah, in imagination, right? In a hypnosis. It's not like yeah. you can't smell things right now yeah. in the context yeah. of hypnosis, right? Um, so like if you tell me to walk downstairs, I will like feel the stairs under my feet and things like that. Huh. That's fascinating. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, for people who are listening, who have like no idea, like suggestibility type, intellectual, physical, oh, yeah. you know, emotional. <laughs> I lay on like the jargon thick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like we, we know, we know exactly what we're yeah. talking about because yeah. we're from the same college. But um, I mean, you can break that down and uh, yeah, yeah, just go from there. Okay. Well, you're, you're the host. Why don't you explain suggestibility to your <laughs> audience? <laughs> I could, man. I could. I could. So, so yeah, why, why not? And you can critique me, <laughs> but I'm not the Go one interviewing. On. <laughs> yeah. so, so as you, like you were saying, right, we're all 
first of all, we all can go into hypnosis. That's a very, very natural state. And um, we, but we're just on this kind of this uh, scale of suggestibility. And some people do better with certain suggestions versus others. And I lean towards kind of where, where you're at, where it's like, we do the, the indirect stories. Uh, and then on the other side is the very more paternal, hey, you're going to feel this, this is going to happen. You are now in hypnosis, X, Y, Z, right? And that still does, that can work for me and, you know, for others, but um, not necessarily for you, right? Because you're, you're very no, you high tell on me objectively side. something. If you are literal with me, you just hit a brick wall. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I mean, uh, like, go ahead. I respond very well to stories and um, that is, so my entire life, like I literally, when I was a teenager, my friends used to text me and just say, tell me a story. And I, I just make something up. And to this day, if you tell me to make up a story, I can like just off the top of my head. And I, uh, I had a big revelation and it was initially thanks to the man that, uh, ended up being my mentor, uh, Joe Burns. Oh dude. Yeah. And, awesome. Yeah. And he told me, throw the script away. Don't, don't work off script. And I really took that to heart because it's much more intimate. And so now that's what I do. I make up stories, those same stories that I used to make up for my friends. I now just make up for clients that a lot of the paperwork that I have them do uh, for their life history and the, um, the questions that I ask in the initial consultation and session, they're kind of getting to know like what story you want to be told and how you want your story told. And for example, I have a client who recently came to me and this person is a software engineer and uh, a somnambulistic software engineer nonetheless. And I, I just decided because this, it came in a time in my career, I'd become very frustrated with pre-written scripts. Like I literally had thrown one away in the middle of a session hmm. and the those three sessions that I had that day, I told myself like I'm not gonna prepare a script. I'm gonna figure out my inductions. I'm gonna ask some questions, and I'm just going to make myself go. And I did, and those were three of the best sessions I've done. And but what I ended up doing with the software engineer is I spoke to them with metaphors of code of visualizations yeah. of computers and debugging and um sure enough that 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 safe place in the, in their head was represented as a computer bank and what the the way they perceived that computer bank uh mandated where i took that therapy just to mm. kind of adjust their own visualization and that's had fantastic results right so it's like when we actually tailor the therapy to the individual client who's going to have you know a different background they're going to have different metaphors mm -hmm. and um now this is good because um the way i explain like the unconscious and the conscious is that the unconscious is just the realm of metaphors and emotions and it, that that seems to be the reason why uh, we humans love stories it's all yeah metaphors exactly yeah. and i ask people one of the examples i give is have you ever watched a movie and gotten angry or sad or happy uh, based on what was on screen of course the answer is inevitably yes yeah so yes why you consciously logically know that you are watching a falsehood you yep. know these things aren't actually happening so why do you feel these emotions and the answer is that your subconscious does not differentiate fact and fiction it's a it's metaphor it's emotion and that's all it sees and that's well everyone but the high physicals 
uh, <laughs> the high physicals don't tend to dig the metaphor or anything like that. You just kind of tell them how they want to be and it's fine. But uh, for everyone else, it's, and at this point, because of this mentality I've taken with my, I guess it'd be hypnotic storytelling, every time I watch a movie now or read a fiction book, I I start noticing like ways that I can retell that story for a different application or a specific yeah. scene. Um, one of the most amazing movies I've seen recently is uh have you ever seen that disney movie inside out yes yeah yeah uh yep have you seen it recently uh, n- no that was like wasn't that like a decade ago yeah you should rewatch yeah. that uh mental yeah. health professionals helped write that movie and it is still used in oh the mental well that makes so much field today yeah that makes and so much sense dude yeah when you rewatch it with this knowledge of the subconscious and metaphor it blows your mind. So, okay. There's that scene where they enter the subconscious and the critical mind is represented by those two idiot guards. And how do they pass by the critical mind? They confuse it. That's my hat. No, that's my hat. Wow. They actually do a confusion adduction to get rid of the gatekeeper of the subconscious. And more yeah. than that, when they're actually in the subconscious, And this speaks to a lot of what I say about fear. One of the first things they see is a giant vacuum cleaner. Um, Because the way that girl's subconscious remembered that is because the way we remember our fears is in that moment in time, frozen in that moment in time. Mm. So to that fear and that perception, that's a giant vacuum cleaner because she was very small when she got that fear. And that has a lot to do with how I address fears in hypnotherapy, because one of the things I stress is when we have a fear or a trauma, which I argue is the same thing, because we're not afraid of something and us are traumatized by it. And if we're traumatized by something, we, we have a fear. And what I, what I it's, it's all where it happened at the time. For an example, if you became afraid of a vacuum cleaner at a, as a baby or a very small child, the vacuum cleaner would appear much larger because according to your memory and your perception, which cannot be changed until it's readdressed in hypnosis, that thing's giant. Or maybe you were bitten by a dog when you were a child and you remember it as this Cujo, some giant hellhound that almost tore your ankle off. Because it was so intense and traumatic where in hypnosis maybe it's just a jack russell terrier that bit your ankle hmm. but you were six years old and you had the emotional intelligence of a six-year-old so you're going to retain that memory as a six-year-old until you readdress it and allow that person to uh gain a new subconscious understanding and association of that event so I'm going to try to play devil's advocate here mm-hmm. and say, okay, I get it that, you know, when we were six, maybe we were scared of a vacuum cleaner because it seemed very big or a dog or whatnot. And we had a distorted perception, right? Mm-hmm. But now that we're adults and that we have developed our prefrontal cortex and our reasoning, and now we can go and we can actually experience that, you know, dogs are generally safe for the, for the most mm-hmm. part and, and happy and man's best friend. Or the vacuum cleaner, you know, it's fairly harmless. Right. And so uh, why can't we just maybe um, do a little bit of exposure therapy, a little bit of cognitive behavioral therapy and just say, hey, Uh, this is uh, this is false. This, you know, you can sometimes. um, And it really depends on how traumatic the memory is. And really, a lot of the way that fears are addressed in hypnosis has to do with uh, desensitization that the Mm. same things you would do in the physical world you can do mentally if you were afraid of dogs rather than go so far as to 
address that fear live and in person with the dog, you could go through that same process subconsciously and realize that you have control over that emotion. There's, uh, as you know, there's something called circle therapy Mm -hmm. where in hypnosis, you are presented with a fear or an anxiety and you are asked to recall that fear and the emotions associated with that fear consciously. So you bring it up on purpose. And then at the, in the same time, you tell them, bring it back down. And the purpose of this is for one, every time you tell them, bring it back up, it's a little less, but they gain the understanding that your emotion and your reaction is under your control. The way that you choose mm-hmm. to react to this fear is 100% under your control. And once there is that realization, that fear tends to fade. Um, or it's not yours. Uh, that's an interesting thing I've encountered before. What do you mean? So, it's not yours. <laughs> <laughs> just that. Um, so I did a, a podcast uh, a couple months ago uh, about fear. It was called What the Fear? It's run by two clowns, and they were interviewing a German spy who had a fear of heights. And. <laughs> I, uh, and this is on my website, by the way, everything I'm about to say, you can listen to this interview, but this, this person, this man, um, not to really shy away from it. He was a government killer. Like he is what he did. He was special operations. He went into places he couldn't talk about and did things he couldn't talk about. He was afraid of heights as unusual as that is. And uh, this was all done in the period of about 20 minutes. I, I tranced him. I took him back that moment on the plane because he got that fear from his first training jump when he was 17. And in the process of just walking him through that moment, he realized something that he had totally forgotten about until that moment in hypnosis. And Obviously, this person was very high physical, so they said they could feel the vibration of the engines, they could smell the gas on the plane, they were there. Uh, The kid that jumped before him screamed in terror, and he went from being fine and calm to terrified, but he didn't remember that. And so in this moment, he realized that this fear he had been carrying for decades wasn't even his and i called him out of trance and within five minutes of that he was hanging off the side of a balcony saying like i don't feel a thing huh so yeah obviously this is all in hypnosis yes um not the balcony thing yeah that's that's (laughs) interesting so he remembered in hypnosis the um the other guy just got scared and it wasn't even his fear that that kid's fear transferred to him and before he had time to process it he's kicked out the door so this Mm -hmm. entire time he's been perceiving this event as his fear when as you know if we're around someone that's afraid or scared or happy if but for a short moment we feel that before we process it out as not ours but what if you didn't get that chance But if you felt that fear and before you could be like, man, that kid was scared. Somebody's grabbing you by your collar being like, your turn. Out. And he just perceived that as his fear. So yeah, fear didn't belong to him. Wow. So I'd be curious um, on your philosophy when it comes to trauma. Right. So for that particular case, I guess he just, he was just able to kind of remember and, and, and bring up that unconscious material and then, oh, hey, this is not my fear. Um, but do you think for, for trauma, actually, before we even get to that, what what do you mean when you say trauma? Trauma is any event that leaves an impression later down the line, usually negative. Uh, I guess it should be specifically negative. Um, something that leaves an imprint, something that... Uh, like okay, this to be since seen the movie Inside Out, 
trauma is when a negative memory becomes a core memory and mm. that, that it becomes in a core memory is an aspect of your personality. So it's oh. whenever something negative becomes a core aspect of your personality, because of course we all go through negative things, but what if that negative thing was so extreme or its perception of was so extreme that it, formed every opinion and perception that you had after that event because it was a core part of your personality. Hmm. That's why that movie's so good. Like Dude, I need to rewatch this. You really do. I took notes. I've got notes somewhere on that damn movie. Bro, yeah, I've I feel like I've matured so much since then. And then with the knowledge of of hypnosis and now parts therapy. So I don't know if you ever heard of uh, internal family systems or any kind of parts therapy. I'm sure you I mean we it's, it's been mentioned here and there in the college, yeah. but um, yeah, it's, it's so amazing now that I'm in like parts therapy and I'm sure with, you know, when you see all the different emotions, like, Oh, that makes so much sense. Like, yeah, we have all these different parts of us that mm-hmm. sometimes want different things and it gets yeah. into conflict, you know? So and one of the things that I I've really kind of come to realize through doing this work and that I tell all of my clients is we are all, at our core children we are all scared eight-year-old kids we kind of got those because that's when we form our core beliefs from zero to eight so by the time we're eight that's our core self yeah and that that you always exists and that what it means to be an adult is to learn how to parent yourself how to parent your own inner child and that's a perspective that I ask a lot of my clients to take because I, I ask them, especially the ones that have children, like the way you talk to yourself, would you talk to your child like that? Yeah. No. But is that the way your parents talk to you? Like, yeah. Well, if you didn't like that, why are you continuing to treat yourself like that? Why, why don't you give yourself that same understanding? Because what, think about it. We all want to stay up later than we should. We all want to eat crap that we shouldn't, but we have that voice in our head. It's like, no, you have obligations in the morning. You have to get up or, mm-hmm. you know, that's going to upset your stomach or whatever have you. And it's the same things you would tell a child, but you have to tell yourself. So the way that you speak to yourself in that regard is very important. Yeah. Um, What I've realized is, at least for myself, is that there's even more than one inner child. You know, there's actually lots of parts of us um, that that have different goals and different perceptions and might get, you know, yeah, might get into fights or something. Um, And so it's not even just the inner child, but like, how do we parent all the different parts of us? And realizing that there is no bad part, you know, you wouldn't call a child bad. You just would, you know, Um, re-educate them. I, I heard something. I can't remember if it was in class or something I was watching, but it said that everyone has good intentions. Yeah. Everyone, no matter how evil or messed up anything is there are always some manner of good intention at their core. Yes. It could be wildly misperceived. It could be the product of a mental illness, but there's always even, even crimes of hate. Even when somebody murders someone else, they're trying to satisfy something in them. They're trying to make something in them go away. So yep. they're trying to, to take care of themselves. Yep. Or they feel some weird obligation to fulfill. There's all manner of reasons. But all all of these things boil down to they be it for themselves or for someone else or whatever have you, it's good intention. Just like your subconscious yes. always has your best intentions in mind. Even with traumatic things, even with bad reactions, it is still just trying to protect you. Yep. It's trying to preserve its homeostasis. It's normal. Yep. Yeah. No, that's powerful. And I think when we understand that, you know, I think sometimes we can like vilify the the subconscious 
or vilify mm -hmm. these different behaviors, but they're all serving some kind of purpose. So, you know, if you're if you're traumatized, it's trying not to get you into that painful situation exactly. again. Yeah. Exactly. So if you have crippling anxiety, it's your <clears throat> your subconscious, it's your mind trying to protect you. You just have this fear reaction that's out of control. And it's there's a lot to be said in terms of healing just for the awareness of that. So much yeah. of my work and especially my breakthrough work with clients has been through subtle changes in perspective and that's really it it's it's not much more than that sometimes there there's some changes to behavior some changes to thought but a lot of it has to do with um the way you look at a situation how you perceive it why mm -hmm. you think this way why you think this way about yourself and although it's stereotypical in therapy i find myself asking the question why do you feel that way where does that come from a lot right and there's always something there's always another layer deeper until you get to that aha moment and you can tell whenever something has left their mouth that even they didn't think of They'd never even made that association before. And just by having that come into their conscious mind, by being able to consider that logically, you've already gone so far in that healing. Hmm. It's like when we raise our awareness and take different perspectives, mm -hmm. then behaviors start to shift. Well, it's like, uh, I'm not a big NLP guy, but there are some aspects of neurolinguistic programming that I really like. And one of those is the mindfulness aspect. The idea of being aware of what you're thinking, uh, taking control yep. over your own thoughts. Um, I thought Joe did a very good example when he talked about how he was crossing the road and he started getting this perception of these men in this car at this crosswalk about how they wanted to do him harm and he started getting anxiety about this imagined situation and he stopped himself and he forced his thoughts to something ridiculous i forgot what he said he pictured those those guys in his car doing but it immediately <laughs> changed his thought pattern yeah. and he was able to just walk away and he looked back and he said they're just both on their phone doing nothing and that's right he's told me that story too that's right yeah and I, I love that story it's hilarious but it's a very good example because so so often we let our thoughts kind of run out of control and it does us some good to stop and think like why do you think that why are you thinking that way why why do you believe like there's something to be nervous about in this situation where's that coming from Mm. all your own trail back figure out why you're nervous and so for so for somebody who like you ask them that like oh why are you nervous why are you afraid and they're like i don't know no idea well what how do you ask mm -hmm. what makes you nervous how do you feel when you're nervous or afraid uh did you were you always afraid of this if you weren't always afraid of this when's the last time you remember not being afraid of it when's the first time you remember being afraid of it and most time in my experience people haven't taken that logical path back they just stop with i don't know and they it's that self-examination is difficult um a good example of this is um i had a client that said that they uh they wish that they were able to perceive themselves as others perceive them as strong as others perceive them and they say well why don't you think you're strong well i got into a car wreck and i really felt like i could have done better and i really felt like i failed why do you feel like you failed well, because I couldn't be there when my grandfather died. Mm. And there was just this dawning realization when they said that. And I was like, you never said that out loud, have you? No. no. I, 
go. So that is currently on the table for the next time. And uh, it's just a good example of just keep following the path back. If you there, there's always a reason for behavior. It's never an I don't know. Hmm. There's an I don't want to remember. There's uh, I choose not to know. But yep. there's not a straight mystery. There's always a reason. And well, that reason then. could be had through questioning, figuring out when and where and all that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm curious because there's different schools of thought in not even hypnosis, but in like therapy that maybe, Hey, don't, don't go back to the cause. You know, that's just bringing up things that um, ne don't necessarily need to be brought up or you can re-traumatize people. X, Y, Z focus on the solution, focus on the future and more of like the positive thinking kind of approach. Um, I'm curious on like what your thoughts on that are. It really depends on the trauma. Uh, if it's something like that they view as very grievous, it is obviously something bad. I don't ever ask people what their traumatic thing is. Like, you can just tell me that something bad happened in 2007. Hmm. And that's all I need to know. Uh, beyond that, all I, with, with that, I will, a couple of ways. But you, there's no direct re-experience. You don't take them back and make them live through it again, like antithetical to the goal. What you do is you take away that association. You make that not a core memory. They don't focus on the events. They focus on the resolution and the letting go after that resolution. Like There's a method that I very much enjoy that involves having them perceive this event on a screen, and they fast forward and rewind fast forward and rewind until all that exists is before the event and after the event. That's all that really that association is. And then after you establish that, you let them let go of that memory of that association. And trauma is very dependent on what happened. And uh, sometimes it's dependent upon um, my referral because many times whenever it's complex trauma uh, I'm speaking to them on referral from a mental health professional mm -hmm. and it, a lot of it has to do with my communications with that mental health professional what have you learned what have you done what do you feel needs to be done um, it's very important if you do find yourself working with a medical doctor or a mental health professional to get on the same page with them like involve yourself in in that client and have them help you help them help that client it's a team effort at that point and i it's it's so dependent because i i work with people with combat ptsd i work with people who have uh, postpartum depression it's just a matter of where does this trauma and negative behavior come from? And oftentimes uh, with the, the combat PTSD, it's, it's always really heartbreaking to do those. And I'm very happy that I get a chance to, to work with those men and women. But there's a lot that example like what they're not allowed to feel because you're expected to quite literally soldier on hmm. and there comes a time that that's not a thing anymore that you have to address what has happened to be able to heal and i see a very similar thing in combat veterans that i see and people who suffer from trauma and that's uh They'll basically go back to the closest safe save point in their head. Uh, it's usually sometime when they're a late teenager. For soldiers, it's generally 17, 18. And they'll start adopting the traits of that age. 
and because they they have all of these traumatic memories from old they when they were older so it seems like psychologically they just go back to the last time they were safe and untraumatized because it's no longer safe to be an adult and i see that repeated time and wow. time again that's wow. definitely interesting wow yeah it must be very very difficult to work with you know, people who and experience maybe. extreme extreme trauma mm-hmm. so it's, i'm it's glad you are intense. but it's it's one of those things like once i realized what hypnosis was capable of and what it could do i kind of felt obligated to offer my services to them because it doesn't matter what you think politically it doesn't matter what you think about war or the war or soldiers or the government anything like that it has to do with these are deeply traumatized people who they're not getting the care and resolution that they need and i i just felt obligated that if, if i have this, this tool set that allows me to give them that resolution i should that it doesn't matter anything at all if i'm anti-war or pro-war or anti-government pro-government none of that none of that matters it's just people it's just men and women who have seen things and done things that no one should be asked to see or do and that's it that's all it is and i've i've had a chance to see wonderful change in those people because so much of it is it's just difficult for them to to deal with that to face that whatever it is that they've seen and uh, to do that is is profound to give them a safe place to do that that is guided and secure and it's it's an interesting thing that for some reason people that are hesitant to seek out like psychotherapy have no problem with hypnotherapy that really yeah um <laughs> and i don't know why that is but it's it's fine and generally i will encourage someone that if this isn't something that they've seen a therapist for and they need to in the process uh, of things just be like okay now that we've kind of helped you through this we need to consider bringing on someone else as well right. hypnotherapy isn't the cure-all it's great for a bunch of things but sometimes you need other stuff yeah yeah in fact like the way i see it is let's attack it from every angle mm-hmm. absolutely you know? there's no reason not to bring in everyone who could possibly help yeah perfect so I'm uh, just going back to, um, you know, how you got into hypnosis and mm-hmm. you talked about, you know, self-hypnosis. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that that has helped you. And I mean, it's helped me. I think it can help a lot of people where they can just utilize this, this modality, get, or, get over some fears, maybe, you know, Absolutely. I'm, I'm curious how you, how you do self-hypnosis and, and what's worked for you. So that's changed recently. <clears throat> yeah. Um, longest time i did it as we were trained and uh one of the the things i've started to focus on recently in my own personal self-hypnosis work and with my clients is nostalgia this weird thing that exists in our mind that seems to be separate from everything else and what i do to self-hypnotize now is i i focus on one of my far off memories like my one of my distant distant nostalgic childhood memories and i'll form that as solidly as i can and just start doing breathing exercises and focusing on that nostalgic moment and that gets me right into trance every time interesting and you think that would work with other intellectual suggestibles you know high emo uh, yeah. I have clients that nostalgia has started to become a major part of our work because uh, it's, I don't even know how to define it. It doesn't exist in a space like other memory. It's it's different. It's more intense. It's standard memory <laughs> doesn't have that feeling 
that's associated with it. And I don't know what that feeling is. Um, I actually, that's one of the things that I want to focus on the most with research as to you know, what nostalgia is and what its uses are in relation to hypnosis. Yeah. Um, and it's, I've already started using it with a few clients, this notion of focusing on intense nostalgia to facilitate trance. And I've had very good effects. Yeah. Well, that's, that reminds me of like Erickson and, and I'm sure you know his story. And by the way, for, oh, yeah. for people who are watching that and not familiar with Erickson, uh, Milton Erickson, he was one of the greatest hypnotherapists of all time and really did very indirect, artfully vague, lots of metaphors and stories and got just brilliant results as a genius. And, um, you know, when he was younger, he had polio, couldn't move, thought about a memory of when he could. And then all of a sudden, 30 minutes later, he found himself. Yeah. Whoa. Maybe well, and that's, that's why a lot of the clients that I'm working with with nostalgia are my clients that have like self perception issues and like self confidence issues because nostalgia exists in a point of pure happiness. You don't have negative nostalgic memories. Really? And yeah, the nostalgia by its very definition is positive. Huh. So, and it's, it may or may, or may not be true because memory sucks, but yeah. it doesn't matter because your perception of that memory is, is nothing but positive, nothing but happy. And so by recalling these memories, you're able to recall this happiness. Uh, one of the more interesting bits of homework that I've given my clients is, uh, Sometime between now and our next session, go on YouTube and look up an hour of old commercials or old cartoon intros from your childhood or something like that. Um, cartoon Network. Yeah, something. Oh. I've uh, I spent like two hours one night just watching intros to cartoons from the '90s. Like that's it, and I I've kind of become very focused on it. I. I very much love that sensation of nostalgia. I think it's important therapeutically. That's kind of why I put so much effort into exploring it myself. Yeah. Uh, anytime I have like a nostalgic memory or thought, I kind of try to capture that and examine it and like figure out what I could do to bring myself back to that time. And it's just that ponderance alone has a hypnotic effect. And I don't know what it is about where nostalgia exists in the memory, but mm -hmm. it's, it's absolutely present. Um, there is an odd field of science that's kind of coming up now with the quantum sciences. And there are some individuals doing work right now, uh, or up to it, including hypnosis that are absolutely fascinating. Um, the, the main person I'm speaking about is this guy named Dr. Dean Radin, who is the head of the Institute of Noetic Sciences. And, Got you. Yep. I heard of them. Uh, he wrote a book called real magic. That is the scientific research and analysis behind certain processes like ESP, whatever have you. Um, and it's done strictly from the view of science and research. And these things are related to hypnosis because if the Institute can be said to have any goal or direction, it's consciousness research. Why? What are we? Why are we? That kind of thing. Yeah. And the book doesn't really answer any of those questions, but the book does provide... Uh, an interesting indication of the direction of science and what we're looking at in the next 20 years. One of the most fascinating things uh, about living in this time certainly isn't the plague or climate death, but uh, <laughs> there is a concept called the singularity. And 
there's a version that exists in AI and there's a version that just exists as humanity. And the, the idea of the singularity in terms of humanity is that human technological eras are exponential that to get from the the bronze age to the iron age was like 2000 years from the iron age to the industrial age at a thousand industrial age only lasts 200 then the you get to the point now that the internet age only lasts 20 years so oh we're not are we oh yeah you're right <laughs> uh-huh. i was just trying to think um, like well, yeah. And so. previous to that, the computer age only lasted like 50. And huh. so now we are approaching this point in human evolution and development that um, our progress, the, the human era, can no longer be measured. That each human technological era begins to overlap itself and that progress became becomes imperceivable by the organic mind uh we have a date for that and it's 2045 uh between 2045 2055 is when the singularity is supposed to occur and what so what does that what does that mean exactly that means human technological progress becomes infinitely fast that every day there are new technological breakthroughs every day there is more progress um, how do they even determine this date you know it's well it's kind of i don't really know smarter men than me have done this math yeah but it's you see it evident in human evolution the because there's there was times of our history that thousands and thousands of years were spent the same or centuries were spent the same there was no real development it was just kind of an age living in the era that we live in now it becomes very difficult to conceive of that because even if you've been around for 20 years you've seen insane amounts of progress and that simply just didn't happen previously right that ever since the industrial age for better or worse we've sprinted towards this exponential progress and as to what the singularity looks like i don't know uh i surely just hope it's not a new iphone a day uh well, i'm hoping it's not the ai you know um oh god taking I, over the world and the matrix i uh i'm kind of opposed to ai kind of not because to get ai we have to first solve the consciousness problem and if we solve the consciousness problem, good luck. Uh, that pretty much unlocked the singularity right there. But mm. at the same time, okay, let's say if we unlock consciousness, let's say we've created an artificial intelligence, we have created a thinking, feeling machine. Feeling what? How do you know that consciousness implies emotion? What? How do you know what that emotion right. is? Right, it's defining consciousness. Mm -hmm. which is the tricky part so and then the one of the interesting questions i've it's been posed to me is uh does emotion evolve are we more emotionally intelligent now than we were 500 years ago you gotta remember 500 years ago what was considered fun was watching the local heretic get gutted in the public square so i really have to think that yeah we have well, kind of grown I, I do think we've grown in some ways. And at the same time, you know, there's always going to be some kind of watching people get, you know, it'll be a violent movies, um, oh, yeah. you US, UFC, you know, we, we, I mean, I, I, I remember, remember, yeah, I don't know how old you are, but I'm <laughs> almost 40. Uh, there was a show on in the 90s called America's Funniest Home Videos. That's right. And, it was hosted by Bob Saget for some reason. <laughs> and uh, there used to be a rule when it first came out that no one could get hurt in the video. It was an explicit rule that what? no one could be injured. Yes. 
Well, and then dude getting hit in the nuts by a football won three years in a row, and they realized where their entertainment value actually was. Exactly. Because when I watched it, it was like 80% people getting hurt. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, And uh, uh, that's an interesting aspect of humanity that, to my knowledge, only the Germans have attempted to quantify. Uh, They have a word called uh, schadenfreude, which basically, if I remember right, translates to the sad joy. And it is the pleasure that you get from other people's pain. (laughs) It is the reason you laugh at someone falling downstairs. It's the reason you laugh at anything like that. The the Germans have a word for it. It's schadenfreude. It It exists universally. And that is the very reason that... um, that, that things like America's Funniest Home Videos or Jackass exists. Like, uh, and it really has to... I, I wonder, really, what is it psychologically that makes us like that? Is it a survival aspect of, that ain't me? It's a fair uh, question. Yeah, I don't know. Well, because one of the weird questions I've never heard answered is, uh, why do we laugh? Like, What even is laughter? Right, what is humor? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And um because it wouldn't exist for no reason. Laughter has to have a function. And the most interesting notion for that I've heard is it was made as a diffusal mechanism. The the whole idea of why we find humor or awkwardness humorous because of like let's say you were walking around a pack way back in the day and you heard the bushes rustle and everyone gets scared you see that a rabbit jumps out so you laugh and that signal which creates a neurological response in any human that hears it is a way to signal the all's clear and maybe it's a way to signal that hey that wasn't me that just slammed into a fucking curb on a bicycle or something like that like i don't know what that is i don't the uh, define what humor is or why we laugh to begin with is right. a difficult question and then you make it even more complex by the fact that there's some animals that laugh really? uh huh. rats will laugh horses will laugh um horses rats? have displayed complex humor rats will laugh that's you could tickle a rat and it'll laugh it'll giggle that is so strange wow rats are hyper intelligent um a really horse there's some search horse prank on youtube <laughs> and you will get nothing but videos of horses taking revenge on people and laughing about it or playing a prank on their handler or something wow. and it's fascinating that's always been the strangest thing to me because that implies very complex emotional intelligence to actually yeah. have humor yeah wow well, we've definitely strayed. This, this is a very interesting topic for sure, man. <laughs> like, like deep philosophical, psychological, like cultural, uh, what's it called anthropology, anthropological questions. Um, kind of tying it back to like hypnosis. What well, I mean, you were talking about the singularity and consciousness. Was that, were you going somewhere with that in terms of hypnosis? Who knows? Uh, <laughs> well, probably where I was going with that. Um, if not where I'm going now, is that what we do is going, if it's not already, it is going to become vital to consciousness research and what it means to, to have that type of increased development that we are able to analyze ourselves and others in ways that we haven't really been able to in the past. I've heard some theories that the notion of metaprogramming, of being able to actively change our thoughts and behaviors is uh, an evolutionary step, that that is not something we've always had, that this ability to change everything about ourselves to suit our purposes is evolutionary. And Mm. I'll actually take that one step further and one of the things that I propose in many of my interviews, we don't have free will. 
if everything of what we do is a product of association and learned behavior, how right. is that in any way an expression of choice? Now, where free will comes in is when you choose to alter that behavior to suit your life better. When you choose how you want to view something. When you choose how you want to act and react to something. Right, but aren't those also dictated by past programming, by culture, um, your knowns, so to speak? Yeah, could be, but it is the conscious choice of Say if you have anxiety and you wish to resolve it, that is a conscious choice. Um, right. Another example I give is if you don't like a certain food, well, stop. Like it. But you can't? Okay, well, what if you could make that choice? What if you could just choose to yeah. like a certain food or like reading or like something in particular? What if your association was different? And that's where the change comes in. That's where the choice comes in. At least I think mm. that's just yeah. the, uh, the logical quandary that I like to present to people. Yeah. You know, this, this whole free will discussion, man, that's, that's above my pay grade. I do actually lean <laughs> on most days. I lean towards, you know, there probably isn't free will, but what I will say is I think it's important for us to believe that there's free will, even if there's not. Mm. To just to function in society and for like mental Absolutely. health and, and yeah um there is a lot of things like that that we don't really have time to get into today but that <laughs> exist of you you just have to play along to function that like i the biggest landmine in thought projects i can think of is simulation theory because you can neither prove it nor disprove it so you could just continually fall down that rabbit hole. And so what is simulation theory? The, the idea that we live in a simulation. Oh, okay, yeah, the matrix. Theory. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, yeah. Uh, there is absolutely no way to prove it. There's absolutely yep. no way to disprove it. Yep. And I have known well, a couple of people that fell far down that hole. Yeah. So now this is not a lot of quantum physicists. Okay, and obviously I'm not anywhere near that that realm and the, the intelligence, but what from what I've heard and read and understand as a layman is that there is an interpretation that would lead to us being in a simulation. There are some quantum physicists who would say that. And um uh, who's the, the dude idea that it is yeah statistically more likely that we're in a simulation than not. And is it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is and it, the singularity comes into that because it assumes that any civilization that gains enough technology to run a simulation will do so simply to gather information. And that given our technological progress, it is more likely that we have reached that point and we are in a simulation than it is not so Wait, maybe the similarity is just when our and you know, when our holes pop open and we all get to come play in the real world wow you know what i think this actually ties nicely into hypnosis yeah absolutely. because our beliefs our core beliefs a lot of them are just bs yeah. it's all perception yeah. Reality is perception, and as hypnotist, we can help you change that perception. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't know if you if you've been part of like a stage hypnotist uh, show, hypnosis show. No, I'm actually opposed to stage hypnosis. What? Uh, it's something I've come to develop. Is like, yeah, I get that reaction a lot, but speaking to clients and speaking to podcasters doing interviews. Stage hypnosis is responsible for 90% of the misconceptions and falsehoods about hypnosis. And I, can see I that. to me, hypnosis and hypnotherapy is a very, very, very powerful tool. And yeah. it needs to be regarded as such. And if we're up on stage using what is supposed to be a powerful tool to make people stand on their head, that doesn't 
allow people to view it with the the gravity that they should because to them it becomes this this parlor trick this and more than that i've encountered people who've had negative experiences with stage hypnotists Uh, because of what they've experienced on stage they would never get hypnotized again hmm. and I've, I've thought about that a lot would i ever do stage work and i think at this point the answer is no uh i would do parlor work like within a small setting like trancing one person in front of a small group just as a demonstration that's fine but doing it as a spectacle in front of a crowd i think personally and this is only my opinion that it robs hypnosis of some of the dignity that it deserves hmm. and i can understand why it exists because yeah it's a neat thing but like given how important i feel that hypnosis is to in the understanding of it is to our health the damages the its capacity to do so by it being stage show here's here's my counter argument um because if you can show somebody that you know hey i can make you bark like a dog cluck like a chicken uh via the power of hypnosis imagine what it'll do therapeutically imagine how easy it is for you to quit smoking or lose weight or you know but how many go to anxiety are going to be convinced with that versus how many people are going to be convinced that it's fake or that yeah no i get the process or that it's mind control yeah and that's that's really where the contribution to the negativity comes in and the media doesn't help because every time you see a movie where hypnosis is involved outside of uh black magic that one movie from the 40s um it's all bullshit like it's Mm -hmm. all just weird that's not actually how that works but it makes people believe it that's why you you ask someone to imagine what a hypnotist is first thing they think is that i have one somewhere hey it's a legit induction man it actually works i know that's the whole reason i dug mine out is because like man if i'm a hypnotist i want to trance someone with a pocket watch exactly Uh, (laughs) that's why i got it too just for that yeah 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 Yeah. (laughs) Got you. Well, oh, I feel like this might be like a good stopping point, man. It's been a fun conversation. I don't know if there's anything that you, yeah, man. Thank you for coming on. And um, uh, is there anything maybe you want to end with before um, you know? I ask you how how people can find you and work with you. Um. Well, one of the things I always like to end with, you've already mentioned that hypnosis is natural. It's normal. It's it's not a metaphysical thing that this is a natural function of the human mind and that there's no reason not to utilize it for positive change. It's there anyway. We're not adding anything. So it's, it's something that I believe anyone can benefit from. But if anyone wants to get a hold of me, uh, like I was so enthusiastically introduced, my name is J. Robert Parker. I own Twin Ravens Hypnotherapy and Research LLC. And you can get a hold of me through my website at www.twinravens.org. Very nice. And you are doing a group hypnotherapy as well? Oh, yes. Um, I If you go to meetup, uh, meetup.com and search for Twin Ravens Hypnotherapy, I have a bi-weekly group hypnosis that I'm starting up. Uh, it's kind of as an experiment, see how well it catches on. But it's just... Uh, Every other week, just doing some general relaxation, motivation, basic stuff. And that way, anyone that wants to be able to experience hypnosis gets the opportunity. It's obviously not the same as one-on-one, but the results may vary. Some people get a very profound experience. Some people, lightly so, but you always get something. They let yeah. you know what it is. Yeah, and awesome. Great talking yeah. to you, man. Absolutely. And I just want to vouch for Robert's skill and his compassion and passion in this work because I've been in one of those group uh, hypnotherapy sessions and it was very powerful. So I really recommend anyone who wants to experience the power of hypnosis to change their lives to go with 
to it with Robert and you're in good hands. So thank you, man. Thank you for coming on. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right. Peace out, guys.